Uh, hi everyone, thanks for joining us. This is our first um, our first presentation session for the uh, the CentOS Dojo at uh, at Virtual Fosdom, I suppose. Uh, and we have Adrian Reber here talking to us about Mirror Manager and CentOS Stream Nine. Um, Adrian, thanks. Take it away. Hi, uh, thanks for having me, and uh, welcome to my session, uh, Mirror Manager and CentOS Stream Nine. So. So <clears throat> Mirror Manager is in use for Fedora and Apple for quite some time now. And I haven't um, really had a talk um, about it for a couple of years. So I thought I'll take this opportunity um, now that we are using Mirror Manager all for CentOS Stream 9 to introduce Mirror Manager to the CentOS community so that they know what happens if they request the mirror, what happens in the back end. And, and oh, I also want to take this opportunity to um, um, tell the Fedora community what has happened in the last few years since I last um, had a presentation about Mirror Manager. And um, some things about myself. So I'm actually running a mirror server since 1998. And one of the first things I mirrored was ftpredhat.com at the time. And I'm involved in Fedora for almost 20 years now. I was involved in Fedora US. And I actually wrote a mirror management uh, scripts for Fedora US at the time. It was never deployed, but I already was interested in the topic. And then when a Mirror Manager came along and for Fedora, I um, immediately put my mirror in there, and I also contributed the first patches to Mirror Manager to the original code in 2008 when it was still pretty new. Um, so I'm, I think I'm the main point of contact for Mirror Manager now since uh, 2016. I work at Red Hat in the core kernel team, so I'm not directly involved with, with Fedora infrastructure um, during my work. I'm working mainly on, um, on on checkpoint restore, CRIU, and trying to get it into container runtimes, container engines, and Kubernetes. <laughs> Just reading the comments. Um, yeah, maybe that's, um, yeah, Firefox. Probably is the reason my voice is bad. Um, so <laughs> I cannot share the screen with Chromium, so that's uh, why I am using Firefox. Sorry. Um, um, okay. So um, the agenda of this talk is: um, I, I first want to talk a bit about the history of, of Mirror Manager, since when we have it, and for what we are using it. Then I want to give details. Um, about um, what happens when you do a DNF install or DNF upgrade. And then I want to talk about the Fedora setup where also CentOS Stream is running on and then some statistics, what we are serving with Mirror Manager currently. Then I want to talk about recent changes we did to Mirror Manager in the last couple of years. And then I want to talk about known problems, especially we are seeing in combination with center stream because um, it's a bit different in the setup than uh, what we are used to do with uh, Fedora. So um, we are using Mirror Manager and Fedora, I think since 2007 for um, Fedora and, and Apple. <clears throat> and the, it was original impl originally implemented by, by Matt Domsch. And we currently, the, the core concepts of the original implementations are still there. So this hasn't really changed much over the years. Um, besides Fedora and Apple, as far as I know, um, RPM Fusion is using Mirror Manager and Rocky Linux. I've seen it also being used there. And since uh, about a half a year now, it's also being used for CentOS Stream 9. CentOS Stream 9 is running on the same instance as the Fedora and Apple instance. Um, RPM Fusion and Rocky Linux are totally separate from, from that installation. So um, what happens when you do a DNF install? 
in combination with um, Mirror Manager. So um, the first thing, thing that DNF does, it downloads um, the, the meta link. And the meta link is defined in, in Etsy yum repos.d. And the important information are basically, um, I think this is the, the repository name. This is created by Mirror Manager while scanning the primary mirror. And the other part that's important is the architecture. And based on those two informations, um, Mirror Manager will create an answer which hopefully fits you best. The meta link um, looks something like this. So it tells you that you should download this file and this file, repomd.xml, should have one of those checksums. And if it, if it has the checksum, then it's the file you, you're supposed to download. Um, there's even a speciality in here, which we currently only do for Fedora. We tell you the checksum of a bit older file. And the reason is we want to give mirrors some time to catch up. So if you might hit a mirror with a bit older file, the checksum of the older file is also mentioned here, and you will still be able to download the file without any problems. Um, other information which are part of the meta link are the list of possible mirrors for your location. And, and you see it's it's putting a preference here. And I really don't know what DNF does, but I suppose it takes the first entry here, tries it, tries to download the repo and the XML file. If the checksum matches, then it continues with its other step. If the checksum doesn't match, then it goes to the second link. And if it doesn't find any repo and the XML file with the working um, checksum, and this is a situation which should not happen, but I think uh, sometimes people see it. Then it tells you that try to download repo MD XML files and they all had the wrong checksum, then calculate it. And this usually means that there was something wrong on our side, on, on the backend side of Mirror Manager, and that we need to fix it. Um, but it shouldn't happen usually. So um, DNF downloads the repo MD XML verifies the checksum, then it looks into the repo MD XML file, and this points again to other repository metadata, and it contains also checksums. So now DNF can download the actual repository metadata where the information about the packages are in there, can verify the checksum against the checksum in uh, the repo MD XML file, and once it has those files, it can do the dependency resolution and decide which RPMs it needs to download. Then the RPMs are downloaded from the mirror. Uh, RPMs again uh, checksummed and signed. So a DNF can again verify that the RPM it gets is hopefully the one it, it's supposed to be. So that's that are the steps during um, which happen on the mirror manager side um, during, or what DNF has to do to download um, something from a mirror. And now I want to talk about how mirror manager decides which mirror you get or which list of mirrors you should get. So the first step um, mirror manager does or the mirror list server process that creates the meta link, it takes the IP from which you are connecting and then based on this IP, all other um, calculations are happening. What mirror is the best mirror? So first thing we look at is, uh, is um, has any mirror specified uh, a local net block uh, uh, for which it thinks uh, it should be the primary mirror? So every mirror admin can specify a list of local net blocks. Um, and then mirror manager will redirect you to that mirror first. And this is in combination with um, private mirrors. Private mirrors is a feature which probably only um, Mirror Manager has, as far as I know. I haven't seen it in any other uh, similar um, software so far. And a private mirror is basically a mirror that can be marked as private, and no one from outside of the 
defined local net blocks will be redirected to this mirror. Reasons for a private mirror can be either your upstream um, bandwidth is not uh, uh, large enough, or you have a closed network and you cannot open your mirror to other clients. But the uh, advantage is you can still have all the data locally in your network, and you do not need to go to the outside and to to um, download RPMs even. And you do not need to have some complicated caching setup. So this is, uh, I think, a really uh, nice feature of um, mirror manager to allow private mirrors. The only dif difference between private mirrors and public mirrors is that we do not verify private mirrors for content. Um, this is up to the mirror administrator to make sure that the content is up to date. And because we assume we cannot connect to it, we do not crawl them, we do not look at the content, we just assume that it's um, correct. Um, the next step in deciding which mirror you get is we look at the, the autonomous system. So we look in which autonomous system your IP is located, and then we look, are there any mirrors in the same autonomous system? And if this is the case, then this is also put on the list of possible mirrors. If a mirror has specified neighboring ASNs as, as close to his mirror, then you will be redirected to this mirror. And uh, this will be put on the mirror list, which is generated. Then the next step, we look at um, internet two locations. So this was, was something new when mirror manager was developed, I think. Um, I don't, I'm not sure if it's still important today, but we still do it. So if you are located in an internet two network, which is supposed to have good connections between other internet two sites, then um, we are putting you, uh, we are giving you internet two mirrors next on, on the list. And then the next step is we look at the country of your IP using GYP, and then you, we give you the mirrors from the same country, and we do the same form for the same continent. And then if we do not have enough mirrors for you, we um, fill the list with global mirrors. So currently the limit um, is, is five. So if you get less than five mirrors from all the previous steps, then we will fill the list with global mirrors. And you have more than five mirrors, then we will not add global mirrors to it. Uh, the reason for, for this is if you are in a location where there are only like three mirrors, then the chances, or at least we have seen this, that sometimes all three mirrors are not up to date enough. And then it's helpful to have a, a global mirror from which we know it's always up to date. Uh, the, the global mirrors are uh, the primary mirrors and maybe some CloudFront caches, which we add with really low priority to our list. And then you are redirected to a mirror that at least has up to date content. It might be slow, but you get the updates or packages you are looking for. So once we have all the possible mirrors we found for your location, we take the net block mirrors and randomize them and order them by prefix size. So large prefix goes first, the smaller the prefix, the later on the list it goes. And then all the other sections, we do a, a weighted shuffle by bandwidth. So we shuffle the uh, ASN, Internet 2, country and co uh, continent mirrors. Um, we do a weighted shuffle so that the high bandwidth mirrors have a higher chance to be higher on the list. But uh, because of the shuffling, there's also the chance that lower bandwidth mirrors are also sometimes um, um, higher on the list. And so that the load should get uh, be distributed evenly um, across the available bandwidth of the mirrors. Um, <clears throat> And this also means we, or, or this, all these steps mean that we create a mirror list for each request every time new. So everyone gets their own privately uh, created mirror list and it's sorted each time differently. So each request gets a different answer. So um, next up is Fedora setup. Um, the setup looks something like this a bit. So, um, the, the front end, back end, and the crawler are still running RHEL 7 currently, and the proxies are running different versions of Fedora currently. And as a database, we use um, PostgreSQL. 
And if we look at how we set up um, CentOS Stream, then we went to the backend system and created a new category, CentOS Stream in Mirror Manager. And then we told the backend to scan the primary mirror for, for the content. And so the backend did an initial scan of the primary mirror. And so now Mirror Manager knows which files are on the primary mirror. And the next step for us was we went to the front end. This is a web interface um, where everybody can enter the information and data about the mirrors, including countries, net blocks, ASN, and all the stuff I talked about is available here. The nice thing about Mirror Manager is that it's, it's self-service. So um, every Mirror administrator can just go to the front end and change the information whenever it's necessary on their own. Um, they do not need to um, wait for us to do it. So it's, they can all do it on their own. So then for Center Stream, we went to the front end and added the first few mirrors we had. And once the mirrors were a part of the database, then the crawlers were able to go out to the mirrors and verify that the content on the mirror is actually the same as on the primary mirror. And once um, this was verified, again, the backend system now generates uh, a data blob. It's 17 megabytes. And this data blob is then transferred to the proxies. And on the proxies, we have running a process which uses this data to answer the MetaLink requests. Um, the nice thing about um, this uh, structure is that the MetaLink request answers never need to query the database because all the data they need is in this 17 megabyte information about all mirrors, about all directories. And so um, the, the requests are answered completely locally on the proxies without ever going to another system, which makes the answers um, hopefully um, nice and fast. Um, so um, in Fedora, and also the thing which um, CentOS Stream is now using, we're using Mirror Manager 2 since 2015. And the original version of Mirror Manager was written in was written using the Turbo Gears framework, and at, at some time when we had to switch operating system on the back end, um, we had the the, the it, we were at a point where it was necessary to rewrite Mirror Manager to work with a newer version of Turbo Gears, and at that time Fedora infrastructure decided that instead of writing it porting it to a newer version of Turbo Gears. They decided to port it to Flask. This was done by Pierre. And the reason was that, as far as I know, um, that there's no other uh, application in Fedora using the Turbo Gears frameworks, but a lot of them are using Flask. So the idea was to use a framework which people know how to use, how to, to um, change. And that's why the rewrite was happening. And then in 2015, um, it was deployed and and it's still running on this it's not the same system but it's still running on on rel 7 and python 2 currently at least the backend systems on rel 7 so the proxies are running on fedora and they are updated regularly so we have different versions of fedora there which means at some point we had to bring in Python 3 support to Mirror Manager. And this happened in 2017. Um, it was, uh, there was a pull request and we merged it. And, but, uh, and then we tried, or, or the goal was to update the proxies um, to Python 3 and keep the backend at Python 2. And that's where, where we started to get into problems. Um, because um, mainly because I didn't knew that there would be a problem um, using different versions of Python for the back end and the front end uh, and the proxies. And the problem was the data exchange format we are using is basically we're doing a large database query and then we sort it all into the big Python dictionary and then we used to dump the dictionary to disk using Python pickle format, and then it was a disk, then we transferred it to the proxies, and the proxies was also running a Python process, reading the pickle format, 
And we had a big dictionary again, and then we could uh, use the dictionary um, to, um, to uh, answer the queries coming for the MetaLink. The problem is the pickle format is not compatible between Python 2 and Python 3, or at least for our use case, it, it didn't work. And maybe it makes even some kind of sense that um, the internal, the dump of an internal structure is not portable between language versions. So we needed changes, um, how to transfer the data between the backend and the proxy servers. And one of the ideas we had at the time was to use JSON. But it felt a bit, JSON didn't feel like the right format to dump uh, 70 megabytes of data into JSON, then read it back on the other side. Um, so um, I started to look into proto protobuf, protocol buffers. And the reason was I was using it for another project already. So I was comfortable using protobuf. So I started to implement um, protobuf export and import. So um, instead of, um, Exporting it as a pickle, the goal was to export it as a protobuf. And what I did, I just used the code as it was um, as it was until now. So the, we did a database query, we created a dictionary, and instead of dumping the dictionary to disk, I re uh, I copied the data to to the protobuf um, format and then wrote it to disk. And on the other side, I imported the protobuf from disk read it again in the um, former dictionary and continued to running um, the, the code as it was. This was not very good. This was not very effective. This was slow. It required lots of memory. And it's, it's clear we copied the data twice. And uh, so it we never deployed it. But at least we had a protobuf format from which we can um, start to continue or from which we could continue to evolve from. So um, at this point, um, we, we didn't use it yet. So um, there were some, so Rust was new and I was looking to do something with Rust. <laughs> and so I looked into porting um, parts of Mirror Manager to Rust. And one of the main reasons to port something to Rust was that the, the architecture of, of the code running on the proxies was there were many layers in between. So we we have um, so we have the on the back end we have a Python process which reads the the pickle. Then we have a WSGI Apache module which talks to the Python Python process to uh, generate the mirrorless answers. And then we talk to an HA proxy because in Fedora infrastructure everything is behind an HA proxy. And we have two installations on each proxy because uh, if one fails, we still get answers from the other process. And because we're using Python 2, it was all running in a container. And so there were many layers in there. And, and the goal was we don't need a WSGI Apache module in there. So we just want to get rid of everything um, which we don't need. And so we the goal was to have just one Rust process directly talking to the HA proxy, reading the protobuf file, and using the protobuf entries directly. And that's what we did. And it's now deployed for, I would say, almost three years, even more, maybe. Not sure. And it's very effective. It's it's fast. And it doesn't use much memory. So this was, a, was a really a, a success. And because this was working so well, I continued to look um, what can we do with Rust. And I looked at uh, continue what we can do with Rust. And so on, on the backend side, we were still generating the protobuf uh, really slow. We were doing the database query, converting it to a dictionary, and then converting it to protobuf. And uh, this seemed unnecessarily complicated. And an interesting thing here, which, which happened to me, is that in university, I was basically told um, in a database course, when the database can do something, always let the database do the thing. And and what we have been doing here is we let a database do its thing to query the data for for the for the mirrorless servers, but the query took like twenty minutes because it was doing a lots and lots of joins and it was really slow. And in the rewrite um, to to um, to, pro, uh, to Rust, I only queried the database each um, um, just the just the table and did all the joins manually in the Rust code. So there are a lot of loops in there. And then I'm exporting it to to protobuf, and and it's it's amazingly fast. So we went down from times to create the 
the, the data exchange format from 50 minutes it's to down to one minute. And instead of 10 gigabytes of memory, we are now just using 600 megabytes. So it's, I don't really understand why it works so good, but it works really, really well. And I'm really happy that we did this because previously it was hard for us if there was something broken somewhere and we needed to regenerate the data. It took us like over an hour um, because the, 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 the it took so much time and now it's really fast. We can do it as often as we want because it just takes one minute. And this was really a, a great thing um, that um, that this happened. Uh, so, and the last step, which I did, um, which I currently did to uh, port to, to Rust. And this is also a nice coincidence that this happened. So <clears throat> in Fedora, we are scanning the primary mirror using an NFS mounted, uh, Directory locally, we just do a, or we used to do a walk over the file system. We are trying to be more clever now, but we are just looking at the local file system. And the original Mirror Manager, not Mirror Manager 2, had support for rsync based scanning of primary mirrors, and RPM Fusion was still using the rsync based scanning, but Mirror Manager 2 didn't have support for rsync based uh, scanning. And my goal was to reintroduce the rsync based scanning back to. Um, uh, to mirror manager so that you can use so that you don't have to mount it locally the other reason why i wanted to change the primary mirror scanning was that the um if we look at the no here no where is it i kind of find it here if we look at the meta link um this part here this is generated automatically by mirror manager it goes through the directories it finds and then it tries to generate the repository name automatically so that you do not have to um, be there all the time and, and create it manually or define it. And the way um, the original mirror manager code uh, did this, this was one large code file with thousands of lines and lots of ifs. And if it's Rawhide, do this. If it's Apple, do this. If it's updates, do this. If it's update testing, do this. So it's it was there was a lot of configuration put in code. And the problem is whenever we updated something or when, when the repository structure changed, when we got Apple Next or Apple Playground or modularity, this always meant we had to actually do code changes. So we went upstream, committed the code, build an RPM, uh, and try to uh, deploy it in infrastructure. And the goal was to um, rewrite this so that we can use a uh, configuration file, use regular expression, and that's what we are doing now. So we're using, so with the rewrite in Rust, I introduced the configuration file using regular expression, and I introduced rsync-based scanning, rsync-based scanning. And uh, the nice thing about this was that, go away, so. Um, <laughs> So the nice thing was that um, just a, a couple of months later, after the introduction of rsync based scanning, was uh, <laughs> oh where am I? Uh, right, Dropkick Murphys. Um, <laughs> um, so the uh, I was contacted by by the Central Stream if we can um, host Central Stream Nine on Fedora's infrastructure, Mirror Manager infrastructure, and because I just um, introduced rsync based scanning back into fedora it was easy easy for 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 us to um support the the setup that um <clears throat> the, the the centos stream um presented to us so that was easy so that's how we were able to to quickly get it running um in 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 fedora so um next things i want to talk about a few statistics from mirror manager just a few numbers so we have over 1,200 mirrors in the database. This also includes inactive mirrors, disabled mirrors over the years, private mirrors. A few of them are only for Fedora, a few of them only for Apple, a few of them are only for Central Stream. So um, for none of the projects we are serving in Central Stream, right, in Fedora's mirror manager, um, there are 1,200 mirrors. But overall, that's what we have in the database. Um, this is the distribution on a map um, from the mirrors, and we are doing around 68 million Metalink requests per day. And 
it's important from the diagrams I'm showing now is that the 68 million requests are completely unfiltered um, because there is also the talk from Matthew Miller, State of Fedora sometimes, where he shows numbers about uh, Fedora and Apple usage, and they do some cleanup on the data. And the things I'm showing here is totally uncleaned up. So there are 68 million requests per day, and this is the distribution by country. So um, in the beginning of the day, it's <laughs> It's less US at the end of the day, it's more US, and that's what we end up with on, at the end of the day. This is currently what we see for repositories, um, lots of Apple requests coming in. Um, this is what we see for architecture, it's pretty one-sided. Um, and so the and oh, and the last thing I want to talk about is known problems, what we currently have. So <clears throat> Something which which is uh, which was is, was new for for Mirror Manager are repositories which are which have dependency between each other. So there are dependencies in Fedora between the Fedora updates repository and the main Fedora repository, but the main Fedora repository is never changed. So this is static, and only the updates repository is changed. And so the um, dependencies are always requiring the same version. What happens in, in Center Stream is now that, for example, one um, problem we saw recently was Python Devil was available in AppStream, and it required the exact same version of Python, which is in base OS. But because Mirror Manager has no idea that repositories are belonging together, you might get, or you're pretty sure will get different mirrors for each repository which means you might get a mirror which is not yet up to date. Coming back to this slide is what we do in Fedora, we give out old checksums so that mirrors have time to catch up on the data. And we do this so that not everyone hits on the few mirrors which are updating fast. And this is usually not a problem for Fedora because most of the times, the updates, if they are not security sensitive, uh, it works It works well that they might get an update one or two days later. But for the combination of the center stream repositories, this does not work. Because then you get uh, a mirror with an older base OS repository. And because we have multiple checksums in the meta link, DNF thinks that's a good repository and you get a new AppStream repository. And then there's a package Python Devil, which requires a version of Python, which does not exist, and then it fails. And what we did now for the um, center stream setup is we never give out older checksums. This means that for a few hours after the data is pushed to the primary mirror and mirror manager picks it up, it can still take up to three hours until mirror manager figures out that there is new data and this information is pushed to the proxies. But in, there's a time frame where it's possible that you might um, end up, where everyone might end up on the primary mirror, or I think there's also a CloudFront cache. So um, this this might happen. And so for a few hours, there might be higher load on the, on the primary mirrors. But um, right now, um, I I have no idea how to solve it differently. It works right now, so this problem is kind of solved. There's another problem which has the same symptoms <laughs> but has different reasons, which I'm going to talk about next. So this one is solved that we get older mirrors because we try to include all the checksums in the, in the meta link. The other problem we sometimes still see is um, related to primary mirror scanning. And the, the primary mirror, as far as I know, is updated using rsync. And usually, if you do mirroring with rsync, you use the option delay updates, because then not the files are appearing. Once they are downloaded, they are put to a hidden location. And once all files are downloaded, they are moved to the final location. So they try to be kind of atomic, not really, but um, the, the time where the file system changes is, 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 is much more reduced than if, if each file would appear independently. 
The problem I have seen and think um, is um, why this happened, why we still see problems is that rsync updates the change time of the directory immediately, but puts the file in later. Mirror Manager re relies on the C time to find out if there is new data in the directory. And we do this because we don't want to read all files. Because especially with the size of Fedora, what we are scanning there, this is not efficient. This takes hours to go over the NFS mounted um, primary mirror. And that's why we try to avoid reading all files or at least reading the metadata of all files. So we rely on C times being correct. And what, what happens now if we are scanning the primary mirror during an rsync run, we are now seeing that the C time of the directory is update, has been updated. So we assume there's new content in there. We look into the directory, there's new, new content. We update the C time in the database. And now the rsync delay update, update run finishes, copies the data into the right location. We do a second scan two hours later. We see the C time of the directory has not changed. And that's why we do not detect the changed files. And so we cannot update the meta link. And so everything breaks after a couple of hours because mirrors are up updating the new files. We still serve the old meta link. And then we have to do a fourth rescan of everything. And um, I'm still thinking about how to correctly solve this. Um, I have a couple of ideas, especially for rsync-based scanning, but I'm not yet sure which one is, is the best option to solve this. So with this, I'm at the end. Thanks for listening and have to answer any questions if there are any. There are a couple of questions in the uh, Q and A. If you want to read them out and uh, okay, let me look. Yep. Have you considered GraphQL instead of Protobuf? Uh, I haven't heard of GraphQL, so no. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> I, I don't know. No, um, no, I haven't. And the other question: How does Mirror Manager obtain information about the bandwidth about different mirrors? And uh, we, we trust the mirror admins to and enter this correctly. So um, this can be misused. There are a lot of things which can be due to the nature that it's self-service. Uh, um, people could misuse the mirror manager interface to redirect traffic to other locations, but this has ha hasn't happened so far. We limit the number of the, we lim limit the prefix size you can um, add to your mirror. So you cannot say the whole internet should be redirected to my mirror. This doesn't work. But if you want, you could add a lot of entries to mirror manager, and then you could get a lot of network traffic uh, redirected to your mirror. Any more questions? Um, anyone wants to use the Q&A or the chat? I'll give it just a few seconds here to get it in under the wire. All right, I don't see any. So thank you, Adrian, very much uh, for a very informative talk. Uh, looks like we're going to have about a 21 minute break until the next talk uh, from I think the next one is Jack and Andrew talking about Elevate. So uh, feel free to mingle in the hallway track or um, go take a break or whatever. So we'll see you all back in 21 minutes. Thanks, Adrian. Yeah, thanks.